Okay, good morning. Uh, so start, I'm the director of the Institute of Social Sciences, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Institute, into the University of Lisbon, for this uh, workshop on the sociological gaze on science and society relations. Uh, you will have the occasion during these two days of visiting uh, uh, our institute, the Institute of Social Sciences. We are uh, an institute, uh, uh, a research institute, which is a part of the University of Lisbon. We are basically a research uh, school and also a graduate school with uh, running, uh, not alone, but with other schools of the University of Lisbon and other universities, eight, eight PhD programs. So we have this dimension of graduate school, also research with seven, with seven uh, um, research groups in different uh, fields of the social sciences covering in an interdisciplinary mood uh, the different topics concerning uh, uh, Portuguese society and uh, its relations with uh, the global world. And of course, one also one of the dimensions of uh, our activity is also the dimension of the relations uh, 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 science and society and so uh, uh, the topic of uh, this workshop is at the very heart of uh, uh, the, the activities of uh, our institute because in all research groups and also in the observatories that we we run here at the institute this permanent concern with uh, the, the 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 purpose of doing science in order to make it uh, relevant for the society that science tries to explain is of course uh, a main proposal in the main uh, topic of uh, all uh, the activities of our researchers. So I, I would say that uh, there is no place that could be more adapted to welcome uh, this uh, workshop organized by the uh, 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 European Sociological Association and, and, and by the, uh, the science and society uh, um, uh, work group I within this uh, uh, European uh, uh, Sociological Association, and so I would like to thank Anna Licard, who was the local organizer of the of uh, this workshop, and of course also the representatives of the uh, European Sociological Association, namely Inge van der Weyden, to whom I would like to, in, in the name of the Institute, on behalf of the Institute, to thank the, society, the association for uh, uh, choosing ICS to organize this workshop. So, welcome. I hope you will have uh, at least nice weather and uh, an opportunity <laughs> to also uh, to visit and to enjoy uh, Lisbon if you have time to do it and uh, also to wish you, of course, b basically a, a, a fruitful and successful workshop. Thank you for coming and I give the floor immediately to Inga uh, for also a short presentation. Thank you. I also would like to welcome you to this workshop organized by SSTNet. And I want to give you in, in a few minutes some uh, background about the SSTNet. Uh, my name is Inge van der Weide, I'm the co-chair of uh, the SSTNet. And SSTNet stands for uh, the Sociology of Science and Technology Network. And uh, what is the aim of the, of the network? Uh, we wanted to provide a European platform for scientists, for especially for sociologists, and providing a European forum for the development and discussion dissemination of uh, research. On, on all social aspects of science and technology. And um, especially when we are talking about theory construction, about um, uh, interpreting empirical, qualitative and quantitative studies. And also um, we self-reflect about the methodological choices we, we use in our research. And um, as was uh, already presented, the SSTNet is part of ESA. European Sociological Association, and we are a network in that uh, association. And as a STNET now consists of 78 members uh, from 20 European countries. And uh, we have also uh, started a collaboration with uh, EAST, with the European Association for the Study of Science and Technology, and also with the International Sociological Association, the ISA. And um, members in our uh, as a STNet board, but also uh, members of EAST and ISA. And um, when we talk about boards, as a STNet has two boards, uh, a coordination board and an advisory board. And what we do, uh, we organize activities, uh, for example, this uh, midterm workshop. And we also organize in the ESA conferences tracks about uh, as a STNet work. And uh, just to give you a short overview about uh, previous activities, 
um, started in uh, last year in 2015. There was again a European sociological uh, conference, and this year it was in Prague. And there we had a, a very nice track called uh, Inequalities in and Through Science and Technologies as Challenges for Sociological Research. And there there, was, there were presentations of 49 papers and 10 poster presentations. And there, for the first time, we also had a, a joint paper session with another network about women and gender studies. So we are again uh, uh, exploring different collaborations with also other research networks at uh, ASAP. And uh, in 2014, we had a very nice midterm conference organized by uh, our university, Leiden University. And we were there talking about research funding and the dynamics of sciences. And again, there were a lot of uh, participants and very nice papers. And we had keynotes from uh, Jochen Klesen and Maria Nedeva. And as a result of uh, uh, that uh, conference, we will uh, are working on a special section in research evaluation. It consists of a, a selected contribution from that midterm workshop. In 2014, uh, we published this book as part of uh, SSTNet. It was about a book about researching scientific careers, and it was an, a result of also a midterm workshop in 2012 organized in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. And this book was nominated for an East Award in 2015. And it is now um, uh, open access published, so you can go to the website uh, over there when you are interested, and then you can read the whole book. And the final slides, the SST net structure, the coordination board, uh, consists of uh, eight or nine people. And uh, the people that are I presented there in bold are present here at this midterm workshop. Aro, Fabienne, and of course Anna, and myself. So if you want to know more about SSTNet, eh, please uh, yeah, come to us and talk with us. This is the coordination board, and then we also have an advisory board. And here you see uh, the direct connections between the different other uh, networks and um, institutes that we are working with. So that's it for now, to give a short overview, very quick overview of SSTNet and uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I think it will be great two days, so I'm looking forward to doing the workshop. Okay, so Anna. Uh, I just want to welcome, welcome you all to Lisbon and uh, say that it's been a pleasure to organize this workshop together with my uh, colleagues in the organizing committee. We received um, a great deal of excellent papers. We had to make some selections in order to, to keep this uh, a working workshop. Um, unfortunately, since I printed the program, there has been some changes. Some participants will not be able to, to be here and present their papers, but I think I still think that we are going to have very productive two days' work, and I wish you all a very pleasant stay at our institute. Yeah, we will start with our first keynote speaker of uh, today, and that's Marciano Bucci. He's a full professor of uh, sociology and science communication, and he is uh, located at the University of Trento in Italy. And uh, he has uh, published several books, including the Handbook of Public Communication of Science and Technology, and the book Beyond Technocracy, Citizens, Politics, Technoscience, and he also published a lot of essays in international journals. But he also regularly contributes to Italian newspapers, and especially with the topic in mind of, of today, and that's very interesting. Uh, he has served as an advisor and evaluator for several projects and policy bodies, including the U.S. National Science Foundation and several European uh, commissions. Uh, he's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Public Understanding of Sciences and has chaired the International Scientific Commu Commu Committee organized the World Conference on Public Communication of Science and Technology. And today he will um, uh, give a keynote and that's entitled Norms, Competition and Visibility in Contemporary Sciences, a Legacy of Robert Merton. I give the floor to you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. And I think you're doing very important uh, work with this network by connecting sociology, general sociology, with uh, science and technology studies. And, and actually, this connection is, is my topic today, uh, because I'm going to, to try to see uh, if Robert King Merton, who is regarded as the founder of the sociology of science and one of the greatest sociologists of the 20th century, um, can still offer useful insights to understand uh, key features, trends, and challenges of science in contemporary societies. So it's not going to be uh, just a historical look, but also trying to see what we can make today of some of his concepts. And I will focus mainly on, I, I think we, uh, most of you are familiar with the work of Robert Merton. He, he died uh, about uh, 14, uh, 13 years ago. Um, these are some of his main works, social theory and social structure, soci sociology of science, uh, of which I edited an Italian version. Uh, which is his collection of essays about science, On the Shoulders of Giants, which is a very strange book, uh, a very interesting exercise in the sociology of knowledge. And his very latest book uh, is actually about a topic that, uh, that is interest uh, for those who study science, which is serendipity, hmm? which is it's actually a word that Merton uh, helped become, become a key word for, for those who study the history, philosophy, and sociology of science. Uh, but as I said, uh, of course, I, can, I don't have the time to, to cover all Merton's work. I will focus on two, on two aspects. Uh, first, I will focus on the theme of values and norms in science. Uh, in light of the, of the relevant organizational challenges marked, that have marked science in recent decades and the resilience of the concept of scientific community to those changes. And then I will start from Merton's classical study of the Matthew effect uh, to analyze the theme of competition in science, particularly with regard to dy the dynamics of reputation and visibility. Okay, so these, these are the themes I'm going to address, values and norms in science and the Matthew effect, competition and the dynamics of reputation and visibility. I will also say something about how this impacts public communication of science, which is man, one of my key research interests. Uh, Merton started, uh, actually his very first work, his PhD thesis, uh, was about science. It was called Science and Technology in 17th Century England. So he was asking a question that was kind of similar to the question Max Weber asked for the, uh, for the rise of capitalism. Uh, he asked what, what could be the spur, the driving force um, of uh, the emergence of this strange phenomenon in Europe, which we call modern science, which we normally uh, locate between the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century. So by analyzing a series of data, for example, about the first members of the Royal Society, one of the first academies of science, uh, his conclusion was that these people uh, were not driven, as we may tend to think, by practical uh, purposes. They were not studying science to do something useful for them and their fellows, uh, but they had different kinds of... Uh, um, uh, of ideas and sports, as he called them, actually, uh, driving forces, which he found in the area of values. Hmm? So their scientific inquiries were driven, according to Merton, by systematic and methodical mentality, rationalism, diligence in the empirical and individualized study of nature as a testimony to the greatness of God, concrete engagements in practical activities as a sign of personal salvation. So all of these virtues extolled by Puritanism encouraged the practice of science. And Merton was finding examples of this in many of the writings of the early members of the Royal Society. Uh, this is a famous quote by Robert Boyle, uh, who was uh, one of the founders of the Royal Society, 
uh, in his will, so before he died, he was wishing a happy success to his fellows in, the, in their attempts to discover the true nature of the works of God and praying, he was praying that they and all other searchers into physical truths may cordially refer their attainments to the glory of the great author of nature and to the comfort of mankind. Hmm? So this will become the pillars of modern science, the uh, glory of the great author of nature and the comfort of mankind. And this is another quote, hmm? the proof of God's providence could be found in the anatomy of a louse. This, this picture is from a famous book of the time uh, uh, called the Micrographia, which is a book only of pictures. This, this looks like a contemporary microphotograph, but it's actually a very accurate drawing by Robert Hooke, uh, uh, who was the curator of experiments of the Royal Society. And there's a very interesting story behind this book. It is mostly made, it was a bestseller of the time. People love this book. Intellectuals, not just scientists, bought this book in, in uh, hundreds of copies. Um, and this book was made, uh, as I said, is mostly about microscopical observations. It was made because the king visited the Royal Society. And of course, the king couldn't be asked to look into the microscopes, to sit and look into the microscope. So Hook was asked to prepare this beautiful book to show the king uh, how important, how beautiful was the work that these strange people, was, <laughs> these scientists, that, that were not called scientists at the time, and nobody knew that what they were doing. Uh, so it, it's an interesting case already in public communication of science and communication between science and society. Uh, so th these are the, uh, this is the consonance of uh, Protestant, and especially its peculiar type of Protestantism, uh, the Puritan values, uh, that Merton finds, uh, and the driving forces, uh, which, which of course it's a bit paradoxical for us today, because after a long story of relationship between science and society, we, we have become used to see, of course after Galileo and Darwin, uh, so science and religion as, as in, in competition or even in contradiction. But Merton clearly showed that for the beginning, for, for uh, science uh, becoming an institution, this is, this is one of the key terms for Merton, uh, moral values, religious values of a particular context were very, very important. Uh, so this was his very first work, and then came four years later, 1942, what is probably Merton's uh, most famous and criticized work, which is a very short uh, paper, it's called The Normative Structure of Science, where he tries to uh, theorize. The question is very simple. If science is a social institution, it must have norms. It must have guiding, uh, it must have guidelines, and actually Merton's called this, which, which is very important, institutional imperatives. And that's, that's what it comes out with. Uh, on the left are Merton's norms, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about these counter norms, which are part of the critique that somebody addressed. I'm not going to, to go in detail about this, but universalism is about scientific claims being judged independently of the personal or social attributes of the proponents, so uh, science shouldn't look at the gender, ethnicity, religion, uh, of, uh, of, of scientists who, who submit a paper or a discovery or a result. Communism, I will, um, I will speak later about this. Uh, uh, it is sometimes confusing, this term, because, of course, Merton is not referring to, philosoph to the philosophical political ideology. Is what he's referring to is the fact that findings and discoveries in science are not the property of the individual researcher, but belong to the scientific community and society at large. Uh, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. So the scientists uh, pursue their aim, knowledge progress, and only indirectly achieve individual rewards, and they have to scrutinize, scrutinize every hypothesis, including their own, uh, until the ne necessary confirmation are available. Uh, of course, there has been a lot of critique about this, say that this doesn't reflect the actual behavior of scientists. 
uh, and there has been a lot of papers criticizing Merton approach. And one of these is this paper by Mitrov. Mitrov interviewed um, lunar scientists, scientists who were working on, on the moon, uh, studying the moon, uh, space scientists, and he found out that uh, four counter norms, specular to Merton's one, could be found uh, to describe what they were saying about their practice. Particularism, individualism, interestedness, organized dogmatism. And actually, <clears throat> one of the points of Merton was that these norms uh, do not address individual behavior, but the institution. This is why he called them institutional imperatives. So it, it doesn't matter so much that the individual is uh, taking a distance from these rules, as long as they are recognized uh, as institutional guidelines by science as an institution. Hmm? So they, they have a certain function hmm, to make the institution work. So, for example, the function of the universalism is that uh, if you think about Germany, for example, in the Nazis and in the pre-Second uh, World War period, uh, if you are not universalist, so you exclude sh scientists of Jewish origin or you make them leave your country, then your science becomes weaker. Uh, you lose many important contributions. So it's not, for Merton, it's not that scientists are uh, better people or morally better people. Hmm? It's that for the institution to work properly, they have to be universalistic. Hmm? And if we look at communism, hmm? uh, okay. yeah, before, before I go to the post-academic science, if you go to communism, uh, communism is functional to science as Merton conceived it because in order to achieve personal recognition, this, this is a key point for Merton. It's apparently simple, but it's not. To achieve personal recognition, so if you wish to be individualistic, the science has to make its result or her result public, available to the others. Hmm? Uh, Derek de Sola Price, which uh, was an historian, uh, 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 considered the founder of what we call scientometrics nowadays, uh, he once said that communicating with your fellow scientists is only an incidental consequence of your uh, asking for recognition. Uh, science as an institution, contrary to what was happening before, uh, before modern science, secrecy, was a value. The more science, the more knowledge was valuable, the more it had to be kept secret. Uh, when, when modern science comes into being, the opposite starts to, to take place. If you want to achieve recognition, if you want to become famous, if you want to give your name, the eponymy for Merton is the most, is the highest recognition for a scientist, higher than the Nobel Prize. When you give your name the Golgi corpus called the Doppler effect, the Higgs boson. Hmm? But if you want to achieve this, you have to make, you have to share with your colleagues and with society at large. And this is the mythology of this huh? is concentrated in, in figures like Copernicus. Copernicus is receiving his book, The Revolutionibus, on his deathbed. So he's not profiting materially or individually from his discovery. Hmm? Uh, it's too late for him, he's dying. Hmm? But of course he will become famous, he will influence uh, generations of scientists, he will influence society at large. This is, this is what communism is about. Hmm? So it's not altruism. Hmm? It's actually the way institution uses individual drive to recognition, hmm? so if you wish, egoistic motivation, uh, for, for the institution to work properly and for knowledge to, to advance. Uh, now, of course, uh, so th there are a lot of work, Agstrom's, Agstrom's very interesting paper, for example, about uh, gift giving as an organizing principle of science. Scientists don't sell their papers, they give them. Uh, they offer their work to their colleagues, um, but of course, this is being challenged by contemporary dynamics. So there are many ways of looking at this. Uh, mode 2 science, 
post-academic 2.0. This is, these are the, um, for example, the four features that John Zyman uh, described as dominant in post-academic science. Uh, which is quite different from the one Merton used to know and to describe, that it's proprietary. Uh, scientists are more and more keen or are more and more uh, induced to patent, to protect their discoveries. It's local. It's not even universalistic. It's embedded in local networks. It serves local needs. It's authoritarian. It's commission. It's experts. So, how do we deal with this um, metle drawing on Merton's work and tradition as described this transformation of contemporary science as a process of renormalization through which the norm of communism is replaced by the norm of intellectual property? And we know how this has happened in some areas like IT, like uh, the, the life sciences, for example. Um, <coughs> But on the other hand, we have contradicting pressures. So it's difficult to describe post-academic science, science 2.0, as actually the opposite of the science that Merton used to describe, because we have the pressure towards the open science and publishing, and open publishing, uh, uh, especially in its uh, initial sub subversive moment, as it has been described, uh, Countercultures like biohacking, hmm? so people who, especially in certain contexts, use their scientific expertise in political ways, in ways to express their political opposition to, to certain things. Um, so science 2.0, if we want to use this term, or post-academic science, if we want to, to uh, try to look at it in the face of Merton's contribution, uh, is not monolithic. Hmm? We cannot describe it as, as I said, as a complete transformation. Because the communism, for example, imperative, is coming back, but in a, different, in a totally different way. Now, of course, one could raise the question, we, we often use this term unproblematically, the scientific community. Hmm? Uh, sometimes we use this as a synonymous for scientists. But community, we, we know very well as, a socio as sociologists, it's a very, it's theoretically, a very important term. Mm? There's a classic work, the, the work by Turnis, uh, contrasting community and society, mm? Gemeinschaft und Gesellschaft. So community has to do with the dense uh, sharing of values and practices uh, of course, I, I, don't, I cannot address such a big question here, whether we can still speak of a scientific community, but certainly we cannot speak of a scientific community in the way Merton used, used to conceive it. Uh, first, because, as I said, it's not monolithic, it's much more fragmented, also from the, from the moral, from the values point of view, and also because this tangle of values and norms uh, not only challenge the all-encompassing notion of a scientific community as internally cohesive, but it also highlights its permeability. A specific scientific subculture may in fact be cultivated in close interaction with movements and normative and organizational cultures in the broader social context, industri industrial districts or firms, clusters, environmentalist associations, patient groups, mass media. This might give rise to what organization scholars have called institutional isomorphism, the tendency to assimilate practices and institutional models typical of one's interlocutor. So if you work a lot with companies or if you work with environmental movements or patient groups, you tend to assimilate their practices, their values. Uh, so, in my view, from this point of view, the main discontinuity is not the presence of factors such as commercial interest, but it's their implicit incorporation into the actual identity of scientists and into institutional levels. For example, when uh, institutions like universities or research institutions are asked to prove uh, uh, their, their economic impact or their activities or are invited to patent their activities, 
but also the capacity of this factor to structure the dynamics of research. So, for example, let's, let's use this analytical fiction and call science 1.0, uh, the, the science that Merton described, the competition for resources as prestige or funding substantially took place among experts. And then it was transferred to the outside, obtaining credibility with the political powers, commissions from business and media interest. In post-academic science 2.0, the competition for resources in those sectors significantly impacts upon scientific practice itself. And finally, on this point of scientific community, the globalization of research prompts reflection on the extent to which the professional scientific ethos, this is why Merton called it, this is how Merton called it, it's not an ethics, it's not an individual thing, it's an ethos, uh, was profoundly rooted in Western civilization and tradition. The institutionalization of modern science having been nurtured, for example, by values typical of Protestantism and capitalist individualism. And it appears that the capacity of this ethos to act as an undisputed glue for post-academic science can by no means taken for granted now that the industrialized West, in coincident with the rapid and large-scale growth of research in countries like China and India, seems no longer to be the dominant reference scenario for techno-scientific processes on a global scale. Uh, if I still have a little bit of time, uh, let me focus on the second topic of Merton's work that I want to address in its contemporary usability. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with this Matthew effect. Hmm? Uh, there's a very simple story to explain what the Matthew effect is about. Um, the, a scientist, a chemist uh, from the UK has recently uh, passed away, Harold Croto. In 1996, a committee of British experts rejected his application for funding submitted by Croto for his research. Two hours later, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, gave him the Nobel Prize for chemistry. So the committee, the British committee, had to reconvene and change the decision because otherwise the next day everybody in the world, all the media would have made fun of them and criticized them. So this is an example of the Matthew effect uh, of what it means to be, to use another term, a visible scientist. Merton was very interested in this uh, mechanism, hmm, how resources and rewards are distributed in science and the inequality that uh, he found associated with this. And what he found out was this effect that he termed the Matthew effect from the gospel according to Matthew which says that for unto everyone that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he had. So uh, the distribution of resources and rewards, as Merton and his colleagues found it in the scientific uh, community, was not only very unequal, but it was also cumulative. Mm. So the more you become famous, the more you have a prestigious chair, uh, you get the Nobel Prize, then you have access to all sorts of rewards as resources, like in the case of Croto. Nobody can close the door to you. Um, and the way this was phrased by a scientist is, is much more simple, uh, by a Nobel Prize winner in, for physics. The word is peculiar in this matter of how it gives credit. It tends to give the credit to already famous people. Hmm? This was a physicist interviewed by Merton for his work. But Merton found this in, uh, uh, empirically by analyzing results. And this has been analyzed in many other ways, as the halo effect, as also having a strong gender bias. Uh, but let me ask again the question, first of all, is this effect still operating? Hmm? Um, of course, there are lots of uh, data and studies that I could tell you about, but the question, uh, well, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so, on the one hand, it's, it's uh, inevitable that nowadays, with the expansion of science, just to give you an idea, 
we are, uh, th this is a figure from a few years ago, there were 28,000 active scholarly peer-reviewed journals for a total of approximately 1.8 million articles published in a year. And this is an underestimation. We are talking only of a subset. Hmm? So one could say, especially with digital publishing, the situation of resource scarcity, which was at the basis of the Matthew effect, because the Matthew effect for Merton, it's very dramatic for the individual, especially when he's not famous or she's not famous at all, but it's functional for science because it helps focus and select on those people, those papers. There are too, too many papers to be read, huh? uh, too many research projects. You focus on those who are already have a high, high reputation. So nowadays, this situation of resource scarcity, especially in publishing, is it's different. There are more opportunities to publish. But uh, the, the power and the prestige of very few publications, if you think about nature, science, cell, uh, uh, has become even stronger. Uh, 80 of the 100 articles most cited in recent years in the life sciences have appeared in only six scientific journals. This is a figure from Young and Johan Nidis' study. So there, is more, there are more opportunities, but paradoxi almost paradoxically, if you wish, uh, the top resources are even more influential. So the, the Matthew effect is even more extreme. Uh, let me... Let me conclude by uh, looking at this effect, at the, this phenomenon of celebrity scientists, what uh, my colleagues like Bruce Lewinstein, Declan Fay uh, study in great detail, people like Stephen Hawking, uh, who appear in movies, uh, movies about their own life, uh, in The Simpsons, uh, Craig Venter, who is a world-class entrepreneur, scientist, uh, nowadays famous for his, well, first famous for his uh, mapping of the genome, now famous for his uh, uh, attempts to synthesize, uh, to, to create the, the first form of synthesized bacteria. Um, using, using some elements from Merton's work, but also from general social, sociological theory. And this is from uh, an Italian sociologist, Alessandro Pizzorno, who taught at Harvard for many years, uh, he distinguishes three meanings of reputation. Excellence in the role that the person must perform, number one. Credibility, which relates to interpersonal relation and tends to coincide with trust, and visibility. Now, in principle, uh, reputation in science should be of the first type. You're a good scientist, you publish good work, hmm? you have a good reputation. But of course we know from the sociology of science, we know several studies, if you take, for example, uh, Harry Collins and Trevor Pinch, classical study of gravitational waves in the 70s, uh, which incidentally is a topic that now, nowadays is very popular. Uh, you, you see that credibility relating to interpersonal relations uh, can be very important for scientists themselves to assess reputation, to decide with, uh, who is a trustworthy scientist and who is not. Um, so in a certain sense, the Matthew effect studied by Merton can be described as a process by which reputation as excellence turns into reputation as credibility, and this credibility shapes and sustain reputation as excellence. Hmm? So you are regarded as a credible scientist because you, received, you have received the Nobel Prize, but then this credibility, this social reputation makes it possible for you uh, to be judged as excellent, as in the example of Croto that I have, that I have made. But then we have visibility, and visibility has become very important in science, especially in recent decades. The very first study, uh, comprehensive study of the so-called visible scientists. What are visible scientists? Uh, visible scientists 
I take the description of Ray Goodell, this is the seminal study, 1977, as scientists who circumvent the traditional channels for influencing science policy, they take their message directly to the public. They must be knowledgeable, articulate, dramatic, persistent, and sophisticated about press operation. Those who succeed become known to the public, not for their science, but for their public involvement. I think we are all familiar with uh, examples of this, uh, Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, you probably have one in Portugal as well, we have those in Italy. Uh, uh, so uh, these scientists become famous and their competence, their uh, interaction with the media and the public, with the policy arena, goes very much beyond their specific competence. Hmm? Uh, and this is, part, this is partly related to a process that has been described as the mediatization of science. So the increasing sensitivity of science to the media lo operational logic and pressure. So experts active in the public domains, like Craig Venter, uh, Stephen Hawking, Nobel Prize winners, uh, for them, visibility becomes a credential that can be bartered at the tables of decision-making on research policy, no less than to gain privileged access to communication arenas. And the media prominence provides to be, proves to be an important resource for research institutions. Universities, research institutions look more and more for media visibility, and this might condition decisions concerning recruitment or definition of research priorities. Uh, so to conclude, of course, there could be a lot of reflections on the relationship between changes in science and the role of visibility-related reputation. A possibility to consider is that the more the communitarian dimension of scientific practice enters into crisis, so the less we can describe, as I was saying before, science as a community, the more the reputation of researchers and scientific institutions comes to depend on visibility mechanism, one might say external, except that they are no longer external, as the communitarian dimension and the protective shell of the scientific community have become porous to the logic uh, of other institutions, logics like those of the media. So in short, marked inequalities and cumulative self-reinforcing dynamics such as those identified by Merton with the Matthew effect still appear to be present and influential. However, they should be certainly repraised, particularly in light of increasing interaction with visibility mechanism and incorporation of different media, but not only logics. In this respect, increasing permeability and internal articulation challenge the very notion of science as a self-encompassing institution with distinctive norms and values. Thank you.
issues related to recognition and uh, how do I get what's mine when I put this out there. Uh, perhaps you'd want to comment uh, on that. Yes, I think this, uh, uh, I mean, these are very interesting times for, <laughs> for sociologists of science because um, Yes, if we take the, the open science trend, which is one of the trends, as I said, because in, in some areas uh, you, you want to protect your, uh, uh, your work because you, might, you or the company might, might make some money out of it. Um, well, of course, there, is, uh, um, uh, the, there, are, there are studies coming out about uh, with, with so much of this da data being available, open access, uh, scientists are becoming more and more reluctant to do their own original study rather than reanalyze uh, data by, uh, by other scientists. Because uh, you could sit in your lab and very cheaply uh, just re publish papers analyzing data by other people. But this, this could be what Merton would call a dysfunctional process in the long run, because who's going to uh, to provide new original data, if, if this is the situation. And the other point, interesting point you make, is about recognition. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't remember if it was one of the CERN papers about uh, the coming from the Higgs boson series of experiments, but this, uh, this paper broke the record of, uh, it, it's also listed in the Guinness World of Records because it's, it's the one with most authors in the history of science. I don't remember if they are 2,000, 2,500, something like this. So the whole concept of individual recognition, which, which was so, so crucial in, in the beginnings of modern science. I mean, we know, we know Newton fought like crazy to, to, be, to be the first. I mean, the, the Royal Institution had a very sophisticated system to, um, to assess originality and recognition. So, for example, they would seal your, your letter in an envelope uh, so that they would know that Newton or somebody else had, uh, had put this, this result of theory before. Uh, uh, because, of course, the publishing process was much slower than, than, uh, than it is nowadays. Um, so who, who, is the, who is the author of that paper? Who deserves recognition? I mean, there are some arrangements, there are some uh, patterns. Uh, for example, in, in the life sciences, I think, at least for a certain period, the last author used to be the chief of the laboratory. But might no longer be the case. So what is the motivation, for example, of, for a young scientist to get the credit that uh, she needs or he needs uh, to advance in the career? I, I don't have an answer to this, but I think this is, uh, um, this is still something, of course, in a, very, in a very new and very diverse world compared to the one Merton used to know, but we can still use some of these questions in a, in a new way. And do you think that this visibility lies in being good science communicators, perhaps better than good scientists? Um, I think the, well, the, there's a very, uh, in, in the handbook that, that we edited with Brian Trench, there's a very interesting chapter by Hans Peter Peters on uh, uh, what is a public expert? What is an expert in the public arena or for the media? It's not necessarily the top scientist in the field, but it, for example, is somebody who knows how to speak, who, who is accessible, who responds quickly. This is very important for the media, if you are available. Uh, I, I can tell uh, lots of, I'm sure you have stories from your universities as well, but uh, in my university, for example, a very good historian was asked to write an article for, the, for one important newspaper about the conference he was organized, organizing. And he said, uh, oh, yes, uh, I will do it. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, 
is it okay if I do it within a month? <laughs> so this, this, is, this is not possible for a newspaper, of course. Um, sometimes these qualities overlap. Sometimes, especially in the long run, they, they tend to diverge. So th there are lots of criticism, for example, in the UK, especially recently, about people like uh, um, Richard Dawkins or even Stephen Hawking, that they are commenting on things that they're not really experts, <laughs> but, but, but in the media, in the logic of the media, in the logic of public discussion, they have come to... to uh, represent science, so when they need the voice of science, they would go for, for this person. So um, I, I'm never able to say as a sociologist whether this is a, is a good thing or is a bad thing. Of course, it's, it's an opportunity uh, from the point of view of science communication. Um, uh, sometimes uh, can be used in, an, in uh, more profitable ways for, for scientific content, if this is what you're asking about. Um, but I would, I would say visibility as a, as a different logic uh, sometimes comes from reputation. Well, most of the times comes from reputation, but then it acquires a logic of its own. And... Um, I, uh, I'm very interested, for example, in, uh, in the Nobel Prize, in the visibility of Nobel laureates. Mm? Uh, for example, one of Italian uh, laureates, uh, he, he had his Nobel uh, in the 1970s uh, for medicine, uh, Renato Dulbecco. At one point, he, he, he was invited to be a conductor of the Italian uh, main uh, uh, singing competition, kind of a Euro festival. Huh? So... Uh, is this because he's, he's a good, he was a good scientist or was just because he was famous, huh? uh, like, like a sportman or like... Uh, so I don't think it's, it's very different. Uh, it becomes a, a star system logic, uh, uh, except that at the origin, these people have become famous for their science. Or, or, or in the case of Richard Dawkins, somebody say... Uh, not actually for his original science, but for his popular science. So um, I think that there can be some overlapping, but, but the logic ultimately is, is quite different. Well, that's, uh, that's a huge problem, you know. Having, having become editor of uh, Public Understanding of Science, I know what you're talking about. Um, w yes, it's not just a question of open access and proliferation of journals. It's, for example, as you know, one of the mechanisms of the open access is having science, well, actually science institutions pay for publishing rather than people for viewing. So that, that's another important dynamics. But I would say, and I think this, this would be a very interesting topic for studying, um, the, the peer review fatigue, which we know very well working in journal. Uh, you ask people to do something for free, which, which is very demanding, because looking carefully at the paper, as you say, takes, takes a lot of time. So why do these people do it? We go back to the question, to Merton's question, why this... These people are starting in the late 16th century, early 17th century, looking at the microscope. They're not doing this for money. They're not hoping to, to invent something practical. Uh, I think we touch again on, on the issue of values and community belonging. You do peer review as long as you are willing to do it, as, as long as you recognize to be part of a community. Uh, but if this feeling, if, if this uh, uh, sense of belonging to the community comes into question, 
then then you start and and I have seen this, for example, uh, with EFSA, you know, the European Food Safety Authority. Their their activity is 90% based on f- the free will of scientists doing review of whether whether uh, uh, food substances could be dangerous, could be approved, uh, and more and more they have problems, especially with the younger scientists, because they are under pressure to publish and do other things. They don't have time for uh, uh, free goodwill peer review. So this, this I think it's it's a it's a key challenge for contemporary science, and it's it's a very interesting topic for us as sociologists. How how can science replace or revive, or or actually find different ways other than peer review? Actually, in some fields. Uh, I think, in, especially in mathematics, they, have, they are starting to have this meta journal. So you can publish anything, your draft, your paper, you, you upload it to the archive, and then these people will do the review of already available papers and sort of create a meta journal out of it. Sort of uh, reviewing and highlighting for the reader what, what uh, has been. Uh, uploaded that could be good and worth reading, um, but again, I don't, uh, I cannot predict the future. <laughs> yes, uh, I would like you to, uh, to ask you to, to tell a little more about these key challenges for contemporary science. You mentioned already, and uh, I would like to ask about more about the dark side, dark side of this process, because when I, when I heard that. EFSA is based mostly on voluntary work of scientists. I think, for me, it's a little scary. Because when you imagine that first in the EFSA work, we have to deal with very controversial, risky issues, risky technologies. And secondly, on the other side, you have big companies which don't base their work on voluntary work of some scientists who might do it or might not be willing to do it, but, but have very well paid experts. There's questions about some issues like like uh, uh, in equality in terms of power and, and the, the, the knowledge and the, 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 um, the science which is produced at public institutions, at public academic institutions, and, and scientific knowledge which is produced on private institutions. And to link it also with the question of Anna about the experts <coughs> and about the experts which are uh, which are financed by, by the uh, <coughs> corporation. I would also like to uh, ask you uh, 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 about this phenomena of uh, so-called key, op- key opinion leaders, so, so-called calls. I mean, the experts which, where their visibility is not uh, coming from their excellence, it's not coming from their proficiency in doing science, but it's coming from their their ties to private industry. So I, there, are, there are described already cases of uh, where industry working in controversial technology area uh, is, is uh, so to say, rising up their own expert financing them, investing in the experts and making them publicly visible and available so that they say in the name of the companies without revealing their ties to the company. So in this case, their visibility is not because of the experience of proficiency, but it's because of, of the work, of the PR work done by the, by the company. And I think it shows, these two examples show, show mm-hmm. us the other side of the processes you are talking about. And if you could talk yeah. a little more about it. Thank you. Yes, yes, of course, there is a, there is a dark side. <laughs> And um, uh, talking about the EFSA process uh, in which I was uh, asked to, to provide input uh, with a series of seminars, for example, they have a big problem in defining nowadays what in, in contemporary science, in society and science in policy, what is independence? Who is an independent scientist? Is a scientist who is not paid <laughs> for his work, like... Uh, because we, we are still uh, influenced by this, by this world in which Merton started to think about science, that scientists 
Uh, most of the things, of course, they have their own salary, but then most of the things they do, they do it for free. And this is a guarantee of their independence, so to say. Uh, but then, of course, you have the question that you might have scientists who have a relevant expertise working in the private sector or in one of these mixed uh, clusters, techno parks. Uh, so what do you do? Do you exclude this uh, uh, or... For example, if they don't have a relevant conflict of interest in the specific issue, so it's it's a, it's a I think it's a very difficult. But I, I would, would agree with you that uh, uh, it's it's very worrying that uh, many um, many operational uh, uh, strategies and mechanisms are still based on this on this idea that. Uh, uh, might have been adequate when, when Merton was looking at the science. It was, was a rather small, tight phenomenon. And, for example, in, in his work on science in the social order, he could describe all the tensions and interference of politics with science, of the business with science. But we now live in a very different world. So I think... Uh, well, first of all, we, we might have to rethink many uh, practices. And, and also, I don't think we might devise a single uh, golden standard practice that, that works in every context, because we, we, have to, we are dealing with a much more diverse uh, situation, and uh, not just by fields, but with... Uh, uh, different parts of the world, different backgrounds of the scientists, different motivation, different trainings. So, um, yes, this is going to be one of the challenges, and, and uh, um, probably especially for European agencies and institutions which are mostly based on these, uh, on these old rules. Mm. Wow, how, how much time do we <laughs> still have? Five minutes. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, uh, if, if I understood correctly, you, you are asking about the consequences in terms of, the, of knowledge production processes. I, I think we, we have already seen uh, substantial changes in the past few decades. If, we, if you look, for example, at fields like uh, IT, uh, nanotechnology, uh, even the life sciences, you have, uh, I, f I think, the, the, the way, uh, for example, the way technology uh, influenced uh, 
knowledge or actually anticipated knowledge. This is, uh, uh, for example, a rather typical approach, I would say, of uh, late 20th century, early tw uh, 21st century science in certain fields, like if you think about uh, gene editing uh, nowadays, that you, you first try to do something and, and then you might later understand it or you might not even understand it, and, but then uh, this already has some consequences and uh, there is already a, a commercial uh, and patenting controversy on uh, CRISP uh, after a few months uh, and very few publications on it. So I would say the, the, the modes of knowledge production have already changed substantially and they might change uh, even more so. And institution, I, I'm not sure. I think if we are talking about universities and, uh, and research institution classically conceived, I think this, for example, this personalization of visible sciences is to some extent displacing this, this logic of the, of the institution, of the individual scientist belonging probably most of her life or his life to the same institution. If you remember the case of Wong, this famous scandal in South Korea uh, about stem cells, 2006, I mean, this, the South Korean government was, uh, just before the scandal broke, uh, was creating an institute just for this person. And this is not a unique case. Huh? You have a visible scientist, a national hero, you give everything, you create an institution uh, uh, that will be um, driven by the personality and visibility, uh, ability to attract funds. Uh, so, um, again, I, I, I cannot uh, say what, what, uh, what we could be expecting, but certainly things have started to change already. And, and of course, uh, policy regulation especially at the national level, is substantially displaced by these transformations. Hmm? Because the science of Merton, it was firmly in the hands of national governments. If you think about uh, physics in the, in the mid-20th century, when Merton was writing about this, you needed a lot of money, you needed big installation, so it's very easy for... Uh, the big uh, superpowers, the United States, the Soviet Union, basically to control this, this process, to regulate this process. But when you start to, to deal with things like the CRISPR uh, gene editing technique that any graduate student can do with very cheap and small-scale uh, equipment, it's, it's very hard to... And, and uh, when Craig Venter was asked about... This is, this is very typical, I mean, of the attitude of these superstars, especially in United States. He was asked, uh, do you think, I mean, this technique will actually be used in practice? And, and his answer was, the question is not if, the question is when. <laughs> Somebody in the world is going to do it. There, there, there will be somewhere... Uh, a, a, an opportunity, different regulations, dif uh, impossibility to control uh, commercial interest, patient pressures, uh, somebody will do it. That's, that's how these people see it. And I'm not sure they are wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's, don't you think that it's, what you said uh, yourself about what's going on in today's science, that it's, it's difficult to be grasped within this Mertorian notion. So doesn't it lead us to the conclusion that 
looking at the science today to the lenses of micro, it, it's hiding more than revealing. Because I mean such, uh, I mean something that, that this way of thinking is used or uh, even overused in the public when we are talking about the freedom of mm -hmm. science, right? The, the notion of freedom of science is based on this Metroian view of sciences, which is very idealistic, so to say. So in this, in this terms, when you look at the functions today of Metroian view of science, don't you think that it's, it's covering more and hiding more than really mm. revealing something from what is really going on in science? That is simply a useful tool for those who want us to believe that science is still independent and, and still public. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are two answers to this. Uh, one is, I would agree with you if we are talking about the rhetorical use of Merton's, uh, which is normally w what most of my students in the beginning get wrong when they think this is an ethics. Hmm? That's the ethics of science. The scientists are universalistic, particularist. <laughs> of course, it's not. Hmm? But that's, you could say the same thing of uh, the Popper, popper logic of scientific discovery, the way it's been used as a rationalization by scientists, by policymakers, by society, I would agree. Uh, I think this is a reason why I, I wrote this, I, I worked on this topic and I wrote this paper. I think uh, some of the questions that Merton tried to ask uh, are still useful today. Of course, the answers would be different. I think Merton himself, if he would be alive, he wouldn't, he wouldn't come to the same conclusion. It's a totally different world. But asking about what drives recognition, what are the motivations, what does it mean community nowadays, does it still mean something? Uh, I think this is, this is still useful. And, and uh, uh, the Matthew effect, maybe in a different way, is still, is still working and is still stronger and stronger. <laughs> Thank you.